So now that we've covered the basic components that viruses are made of, we can talk about one of the most important concepts in virology, and that's understanding how viral replication works, and that's what we'll conclude our virology study on in the next couple of flowcharts. To begin, we'll entitle this first replication flowchart Viral Replication 1. And so we're going to be looking at how viruses undergo this replication process, this complex yet very effective, very efficient replication process. You could say that the virus's main goal in its entire existence and being is to reproduce as much as possible, and it is designed to do just that. We're going to introduce the idea of viral replication initially in order to ground ourselves on some basic facts on the process. Again, to reiterate, viral replication involves the fact that viruses themselves are obligate, they must be within cells, intracellular parasites. In order for them to succeed to the detriment of their host, they must be within that host cell. And so what general questions that arise are, well, what is going to classify as a host cell? And that question can be answered by understanding and studying what we would consider the host range. The host range provides us the range at which we can have a host cell for a certain virus. So if we have a range that's very narrow, only very specific cells can become, let's say, uh, infected by a virus. Or if that range is very broad, then many cells can be infected, many different cells can be infected by that virus. For the most part, the host range of most viruses is usually quite narrow meaning that it's quite specific, meaning that it's quite small in terms of what can be infected by what. For example, if we look at the measles virus, the measles virus is something that is narrow because it is only, only uh, going to affect humans. That's what we know about the measles virus. It only infects humans and no one else. So that's a narrow host range, just humans. But there are also sometimes going to be viruses that display a broad host range. So we'll say sometimes broad. So if they're sometimes broad but usually narrow, um, a good example of that would be the West Nile virus. So we'll say EX West Nile. The West Nile virus, instead of just being one species, one kind of organism, this can actually infect humans it can infect birds, horses, and even mosquitoes. Mosquitoes is usually the most common uh, that we notice about the West Nile virus. And then through mosquitoes, it often goes to humans um, and etc. Mosquitoes as well. So that's a much broader range. This is a much narrower range. So that's the infection range that we have. What can be a host for viruses and eventually their replication? Now, another important concept to understand about viral replication is that let's say we're within not just a one cell organism like a bacteria, but let's say we're in a multicellular organism. If a virus is in a multicellular organism, so virus in multicellular, let's say somebody like us, a multicellular eukaryote, um, viruses in multicellular eukaryote are actually going to be limited to a particular tissue in this situation. Limited to particular tissue. Because we consist of many systems and many tissues and many organs, we are going to have viruses that attack those specific organs, those specific systems. Think, for example, a cold virus. A cold virus does not infect your muscles, let's say, specifically, what it, uh, your muscles throughout your body, let's say. What a cold virus specifically infects are the tissues of your upper respiratory system. So upper 
respiratory system tissues are going to be affected by this cold virus because this is a virus that infects a multicellular eukaryote like the humans and thus it is limited to a particular tissue. So we have this host range, we have this idea of multicellularity playing a role in what a virus can do in terms of its replication. Eventually we're going to get to that. Um, another very critical thing in terms of replication is understanding the role of specificity and how viruses are specific to what they attach to, what they replicate within, and what they can do as a whole. For the idea of specificity, what we need to understand is that viruses need some sort of recognition concept. They don't just flow into anything and everything. There needs to be a recognition, a specific recognition between the possible host and, of course, the virus itself. Between virus and host, um, and a host cell, let's say specifically, plus the virus. So host cell plus virus, there needs to be a recognition between both, let's say. And that specificity is going to be really tied to this idea of an interaction between two specific regions of our host cell and our virus. The interaction will happen, the specific interaction, the specific recognition therefore, will be an interaction between viral surface proteins, because remember how I said viruses, though they have the components of themselves and they're also their infected components that they took from somebody else, they have their own proteins. So there's an interaction between the viral surface proteins and also whatever else is going to be infected. And that would be usually the specific, and this is where specificity comes from, specific receptor molecules. There's a classic, very important example that you definitely know of about this already. Specific receptor molecules on outside of host cell. So, and we'll write outside of HC for brevity. So, what is this interaction? Well, think of something like the HIV virus. The HIV virus infects very specific very specific cells within our body, which are some of our immune cells. And those immune cells have very specific receptors that sort of attach onto these virus surface proteins, combine together and recognize each other, which allows the virus to enter unbeknownst to the cell that this is something that's going to be dangerous. Okay, So that's something uh, of note, this fact that there's this specific recognition necessary for the virus to enter. It's not just whoever gets there enters into the cell. There has to be sort of a checks and balances feature of the viral replication process, at least initially. Now, the basic features of viral replication, now that we understand the basic premise behind the process, are as follows. So we'll write some basic features. There are five basic steps to understand about viral replication. First and foremost, number one will say, virus binds to the host cell, again, based on specificity. So that's nothing new. So we have to have this binding to HC based on that previously mentioned specificity. So it's not just going to happen randomly, but it will be specific to whatever virus plus host cell combination is uh, in question. So that's uh, one of the basic features. The second basic feature to understand, and this is sort of in order actually, that the viral genome once attached, once recognized, once specified, the viral genome enters the host cell. So this is just the genetic material, the DNA or the RNA of the virus enters the host cell. There are a couple of ways of entering. This genome can be injected into the host cell. It may be uh, through the process of endocytosis where the host cell eats, let's say, the virus uh, unbeknownst to the host cell that this is something bad that I should not be eating, let's say, or it could simply be through a plasma membrane fusion event, PM fusion. So those are three ways the viral genome can enter our host cell. Uh, number three in terms of our basic features is that once within the host cell, all hell is going to break loose in the sense that the viral genome 
the 3 to 100 genes are all that's necessary to now, once within the host cell, the viral genome literally takes over, okay? The viral genome directs very, very specifically and very, very efficiently. We're going to direct the entire viral process through the host cell. The viral genome directs protein production specifically. Okay, protein production. If you direct protein production, you are essentially going to be taking over the cell. So there's a HC takeover, we say, a host cell takeover of sorts, because you are taking over all of the protein production in order for the proteins to make all of the viruses that are eventually going to be the result of this initial infection. So what is this takeover? What does it really involve? That would be step four, the basic feature to understand, is that the host cell, because it's been taken over, literally does everything for the virus that it wants. The host cell copies the viral genome. So we utilize the host cell's machinery to copy the viral genome. So we'll say host cell copies viral genome. So that's, that's great for the virus, bad for the host cell, and also because it's copying the genome, that genome will be transcribed and translated, thus produces viral proteins as well. So it does all this work for the virus. The virus is just directing all of this through its DNA or RNA that has been entered into the host cell. And finally, the last basic feature to understand, viral nucleic acids, so NAs for nucleic acids, plus those capsomeres, those simple units, subunits of the entire capsid, those are two components that will spontaneously self-assemble. So almost um, amazingly, these simple components like a couple of genes and a couple of subunits, a couple of protein subunits will spontaneously self-assemble into a fully functioning, fully infectious virus. They will self-assemble. We get new viruses that are within the cell. And they're going to burst out and exit the cell through a process known as lysis, and that's something we'll look at as we move forward. So that's our basic introduction, our basic look at viral replication. We have these five features that we'll reiterate when we look at some more specific details and understand the host range, specificity, and multicellular components associated with viral replication.